This is Power BI and more from CRM Audio. This episode is sponsored by Kingswaysoft. Kingswaysoft is a leading integration solution provider offering software solutions that make data integration affordable and painlessly easy. Thousands of enterprise clients from over 70 countries and regions rely on Kingswaysoft to integrate data with various business systems in order to drive their business efficiency and fully leverage their information assets. Kingswaysoft is a leading provider of Microsoft Dynamics integration software, including the Dynamics 365, CRM, AX, NAV, GP, SL, as well as many other applications. We thank Kingswaysoft for sponsoring Power BI and more from CRM Audio. Conversations with clients I just had two today about GDPR. Even All though I'm right. in North America, we got a lot of customers who work uh, in Europe. So a question came up: What does uh, what what about our analytics and Power BI? What do we need to be? What do we need to think about with Power BI and GDPR? Right. So yeah, uh, GDPR is on, on everybody's tongue, right? So even for us here in the U.S., even though we may not even be working with. Um, with European businesses, as long as we're collecting data on people in Europe, European citizens, European Union citizens, we're still required to meet the GDPR requirements. And the Power BI team actually uh, just recently launched a Power BI GDPR white paper. So if you need more details on it, you can definitely download that and you know read all 30 pages, how many pages is uh, talking about Power BI and GDPR specifically. And I think it's if you're only working with Power BI, you should definitely download it and, and read it. If you've already looked into GDPR and Dynamics 365 and what how you work with your customer data, what you record, how you anonymize it in case somebody wants to be forgotten, um, all that type of, of features because GDPR is essentially a people process, right? It's not necessarily so much the technology. I think what's interesting when it comes to, to Power BI are some of the auditing tools that the, the white paper outlines. So you can actually go in and see some of the auditing features and kind of get an idea of you know how much access do employees actually have to data that may be under GDPR requirements. You can see who can actually export data, um, get some ideas how the different reports are being used. That would all be a part of a GDPR auditing. So definitely meeting those re- requirements there um, are relevant. Um, but as I mentioned, most of the data, Power BI basically just looks at other databases. Uh, mostly, that would, that, whether that be spreadsheets or Dynamics 365 or a different customer database. So any updates that we make to those databases. So if we anonymize some of the contacts inside Dynamics 365, well, on the next refresh, they will, those contacts will be anonymized inside Power BI as well. So the issue is not, isn't necessarily as big. So if you fixed your, your GDPR requirements and meet your processes, in your Power BI sources, then mostly you are also good for, for Power BI itself. But you definitely want to read through it and make sure because you are also storing data. And for example, if you don't have a refresh on your data, you just load it one time, uh, you may actually also be storing data on customers that have asked to be forgotten, which of course would, could put you in some, some um, hot waters with the European Union. Right, so I guess one one factor there may be you might have data inside of Dynamics that is not anonymized, that you haven't asked it to be anonymized, but you want to increase the security of that data, and especially the more people that are looking at the output. So I can imagine that's one area where you might want to anonymize the data in your Power BI output, even if it's not anonymized in the system, just to re- reduce the potential threat footprint uh, for, that, for that personal information. Right. And it's worth keeping in mind, too, that with, with Power BI reporting, we are often looking at aggregate information. We probably don't need to identify the individual customer in all cases when we're just looking at these reports. So if there's actually not a specific need to bring in all that identifiable data, information, etc., into the Power BI model, it's basically just a potential liability with no added benefit. So right. you could actually exclude it already at that point and just think it into your reporting model and say, hey, we're going to include all this that we need. There's some information here that's on the 
maybe nice to have, maybe we don't need it, like you definitely don't need social security numbers and similar inside Power BI, um, unless for whatever reason you might be reporting on that specifically, but generally you don't need that type of information, so even though it can be tempting to say, hey, you know what, we'll put it in there, maybe we'll need it for reporting, um, just leave it out. And right. the other option, of course, is to talk about the security and adding road-level security, which we talked about in one of the uh, the previous sessions. So whoever is logging into Power BI, you actually have some measures um, that ensures that people can only view customers in their region, for example, or only can view the specific data they actually are supposed to have access to. So that's a part of the whole auditing and control and um, showing that you have those processes in place to make sure that data can really be abused. Okay, that's great. And it's, it's so definitely an interesting, uh, interesting area with GDPR, right? Because it's not like, it's the European Union, yeah, and when it comes to data privacy rules, like you know they mean business. So you you will get fined. It's not like you're gonna get a you know slap on the hand and you know okay next don't do it again, type right. of situation. You will get a fine, and that fine will will definitely hurt depending on the the kind of breach or whatever situation that you ran into. Even if that was inadvertently, maybe there was no bad intentions, but they don't really care about that. Yep. Okay, so I think that's enough about GDPR. We, we've had our GD, yep. GDPR quota for the day. <laughs> so right, next, right. next topic is the uh, Q&A linguistics schema, which is a mouthful to say, but what is the Q&A linguistics Q &A schema? Q&A li linguistics schema. I've been practicing saying it all day here just for this, <laughs> this calling. So actually, if we take a step back, so when Power BI was first released, we uh, a lot of the demo included this Q&A natural language processing feature, where once you had all your dynamics data, for example, inside Power BI, um, on your dashboard in Power BI, you could basically just type in any questions. I want to see. I want to see my open cases in the Western region. I want to see sales from the Eastern region from last month, for example. And Power BI would basically generate a visual based on your question or whatever you were asking for you for you to show. It would say and find the proper visual if it seems to be like geographically oriented. Uh, it would put it on a map. If you are asking to see something over time, it's going to put it on a line chart uh, <clears throat> and basically pinpoint and show you the correct data from the model. And it was pretty much like magic, right? It worked really, real, really well for demos. It looked great uh, when you showed it in demos. Um, it definitely looked great. It was very impressive. However, there were some, some uh, once you dug a little bit deeper, you know, it was definitely challenging to work with the linguistic model and how Power BI actually viewed the data. It used to be a feature that was only available on the dashboards themselves, so it was actually only available inside the desktop service of PowerBI.com, not necessarily on the uh, not on the desktop client. Um, so you had to upload all your data to to use it, and it was only on the dashboards. However, now you can actually uh, um, one of the reason recent updates, you can now also add that Q&A feature to the report pages themselves. So you actually have some uh, that same feature, a natural language querying on a specific report as opposed to uh, having it on the dashboard. So it's basically this feature here where, you know, we can ask questions to the data and Power BI will show us a the answer and hopefully the answer that we're looking for. So you can ask yourself, so what is this linguistic schema that's now coming out of uh, the ability to edit the uh, linguistic schema that uh, that came out? Because one of the challenges that was with the that natural language querying feature was that outside of demos and prepared demos, it really wasn't used all that much. I was actually at a Power BI user group meeting here in, uh, in San Francisco recently and uh, somebody asked the questions like, is anybody actually using this? I mean, we see it in demos, but I've actually never seen anybody use this. And it was a room full of, of Power BI specific consultants and it wasn't really used all, all that much. Um, however, now that you can edit the linguistic schema means that you can actually design 
those questions or teach your Power BI model to understand all of those questions that people might ask about your data, which are going to, of course, going to be different from uh, implementation to implementation because you're going to have different data models. You're going to call you know, maybe even the same type of entities, they're going to have different names depending on the implementation. Uh, it's going to be a whole different vocabulary, different ways of looking at it. So we now get a lot of features uh, to manage that, uh, that model specifically. And, and I'm curious, Joe, have you, have you even played with it? I know you've probably seen it on the demos, but have, yeah, have you gotten upon like just trying it and see how it works? So what exactly do you have to set up if you've got a if you got a Power BI data set and dashboard, what do you have to set up? Because it's, it's natural language. I mean, do you have to seed it with the types of questions or measures that are allowed to be searched for via natural linguistic, natural language, or, or does it come up with those by itself? How do you tweak those? So ba basically a combination of all of those things. And interesting here, as I was uh, reading about the linguistic schema and uh, like all the ways to optimize it and what to do, a lot of it is actually a part of creating the data model, which uh, in essence we should already be doing, not necessarily just for the linguistic schema, but doing this uh, as a part of make, but doing this uh, as a part of making Power BI easy to use the actual end users who consume the data. So that includes uh, during the import process making sure that we only select the entities that we need, only select the fields that we actually need, um, only the attributes that we need. And so we have a type model um, because the more data we pull in, the more risk there is of Power BI mixing up different fields when we just ask it questions. And then of course it comes the, the other task of, and this is probably one of the wrong parts, is that you have to sit and rename everything, specifically with Dynamics 365, because we get the schema name for all the entities and fields. Uh, you have to rename all of those to make sure that, you know, they are called what the uh, user expects it. So whenever they say, I want to see customers in San Francisco, I want to see customers in the Eastern region, they know what customers is. Mm -hmm. Usually we don't have an entity called customer, right? We have account and contacts. Correct. Uh, but we don't have one called customers. So right there, it would, it would already fail unless we went in and do some, some modifications. So here's you know, a question. Uh, is it possible to see what questions people are asking because what I found is you know you can't predict how users are going to use it and certain types of certain types of natural language queries work but some don't but if you can see what people are typing in and maybe what searches aren't returning data maybe you can give some ideas on how to better structure your data or enable it to answer those questions does it, does it log the questions that people ask it does, it does, and it, it actually is essentially a loop of improvement over time, basically the same way as you do with, with implementations and service, that you have the initial implementation, we do the initial model, we, we teach us as much as we can up front, and then we let people use it for a while, and then we look at all the questions afterwards, because you can see those, um, and basically try them out, see which parts didn't it understand? Where were people complaining? I say, hey, well, you know, I asked it this question. I feel like it should understand this um, specific question and show me the proper data. So you can go back and analyze those and then add the information to the model to make sure that it'll, it'll understand those in the future and show the correct data. Because you want to make sure it shows the correct data because you can run into all those issues. Hey, if you want to look, um, break down your opportunities by date, for example, or one opportunities by a specific date. Uh, Power BI is going to have a couple of dates fields to choose from. There's a created on date, there's the estimated close date, there's the actual close date, and it's just going to do a best guess based on 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 you know the question itself. Uh, so unless you specify the full name of it, it's it's just basically going to guess. You can then use all those phrases to basically teach the model, instruct the model to say, if you're talking about closed opportunities, then we want to use the actual close date. If we're talking about open opportunities, we want to talk about the estimated close date. Uh, and kind of specify those, um, those specific fields to look at and use those in the models when you get those questions. So, okay. You do have the option there to go back and basically refine it over time, which is something you have to do because you're not going to get all the questions up front on your data model, right? 
this is one of those things where you ask your customer, um, who, whoever you're implementing from, to say, hey, you know, give me 10, 15 questions you would like to ask your data model. And they type them in, and then as part of the, the initial setup, you use those 10, 15 questions to test your linguistic schema, basically, and make the updates accordingly and, and find out where to to make improvements, whether that be you know renaming all the fields, renaming all the uh, the tables, ch reshaping the model. So you definitely want to have normalized data as much as possible. You don't want to have a table with all the various properties pooled together. You want to break those out and have them on the contact or the customer, uh, wherever you have them. You definitely want to go through your, your data set and set all the types and categories. Uh, I, I tend to see those people overlooking those sometimes because you don't necessarily always need them when you create the reports. Power BI is, is depending on what you're doing, can be a forgiving on on you not setting those categories. But for the linguistic schema and for the Q&A feature, you definitely want to you know specify everything that's um, geographically oriented. You want to make sure it understands that this is actually a part of. Um, uh, this column contains geographic data, so it will put the information on a on a map. Um, you want to have all your your date oriented fields. You want to have them marked appropriately, so that gets on line charts, for example, uh, which is a better way of of displaying that data. Uh, you also want to make sure that you go to your relationships table inside. Um, inside Power BI and make sure that all your relationships are correct because it uses those as a part of the model. And you all in that case, you also want to set all the synonyms that's actually being set on the relationship uh, diagram inside Power BI. Specify all the, the synonyms. For example, we have the, the example with accounts and customers. Um, if people call them customers, you want to make sure you add customer as a synonym on the account table. Uh, and then basically for all your products, parts, items, etc., what, whatever you might have, you want to make sure you put all your synonyms in there. But you don't want to put too many because you don't want to create ambiguity in the model. So, right. which is when, whenever you have you know a word or phrase that could show up or mean multiple things, which of course can be be challenging, because two people two people can ask the exact same questions, but expect different results just because of their you know, frame of reference or what they were thinking of or the context of what they were doing. Um, this is one area where Power BI uses some domain knowledge. So depending on what you're talking about, it tries to resolve some of that ambiguity uh, for you. Um, so th that's a lot of updating and making sure you have a really clean data model. Um, I've always been a, a big um, proponent of having a clean data model and making sure you set all your data types, all your categories, and all those things. And with the Q&A feature, that just became significantly more important. The next step, once you cleaned up all of those things, would be you can actually download the whole linguistic schema uh, from Power BI, which puts you in a YAML file that you can edit in Visual Studio or Notepad++. Um, and add more information to it. So when you have those phrases, when you want to have it look at a specific date or do something more advanced like looking at specific date in a certain context, uh, we want to make sure we look at the estimated close date instead of the actual close date, depending on what you're doing. Add conditions and filters to certain parameters. So when we're, when we're looking at opportunities, when you have certain questions that relates only to open opportunities, we want to make sure it filters it to only open opportunities. The same way that if we have certain questions that refers only to one opportunities, we want to make sure it filters the data to only one opportunities. Um, so we can specify that in the file, uh, export that file, make all of our changes, and basically import it back in. We can also make changes to and see all the things that the Power BI model automatically inferred. So we can actually see all the other um, linguistic schemas and properties that they've added to the model and we can basically uh, make changes to those two, turn them on and off um, if they don't actually match what we are expecting. So um, there's a lot of flexibility in that now to really getting that Q&A model uh, correct and have it be a part of like your actual reports, your actual tooling. It's not so much of um, demo tool any longer. I still, it'll still be great for demos. 
Um, but once we got beyond the demo le level initially, it wasn't as as impressive when you really started trying trying out some different questions. Sure. Now you can actually m turn this into a full blown tool and basically teach people to use the Q and A feature instead of as much as clicking around on the different reports and create the different reports. They'll basically just go to powerbi.com and um, and ask their questions. So how do you know when it's ready to roll out to users? Because I would have the fear that if it's not good enough or a certain level of usable, people aren't going to use the feature if they ask questions and don't get answers. But you, you're not going to be perfect either. So would you recommend you have some users test it out, get their feedback? How would you incorporate that in, and make sure you get it right? Right. Uh you would you would work with a with an implementation like similar to implement in Dynamics 365 where we have a set of super users who understand that we are we're basically in the midst of configuring this and things will improve over time. Um, the same way we would have a number of people who would basically bring their questions. Um, and that's why I suggest you know get a list of 10, 15 questions, and the more questions the better, of course. Real questions that they would ask their data, you can sit and try them out make sure they get the results that they expect. Uh, and as soon as you have refined your model for all of those questions, make sure it understands all the, well, whenever somebody asks a questions with, when did somebody buy something? Make sure that, that when it's looking at the correct date, date field, that the customer is always identified correctly. Then you can actually let the basically let people lo lose ask more questions, and then after a month or two, basically get some feedback. Look at what questions were asked, how many items were identified, and that's actually interesting. When you ever, whenever you type a question into the Q and A model inside Power BI, you can actually see uh, the the words are color coded. It also gives you some type of options for for suggestions that you can ask. Um, but the words are actually color coded depending on whether or not Power BI recognizes this as a part of the model. So you can sit there and you can touch the question and you can actually see what part of the questions that Power BI understands versus the one that they don't. And the ones that you, they don't understand but you want to add them to the data model to make sure that they always look at the correct items, you can then take those out and refine it over time. So it's one of those... Um, it is one of those features that would be very difficult to get correct in the, the first release. Uh, it is something that you want to work with and improve over time. Uh, what about different languages? I know that cognitive services and machine learning have capabilities in some cases to uh, understand different languages. Does this have any of that capability? All right, so this is one of these where, where English is, is the main language, right? And those features, I'm sh I'm sure it will come to other languages. It hasn't really been specified that clearly yet when when other languages might be added. I know the Q and A feature, I believe, exists in Spanish as well, um, but I haven't seen the linguistic schema in other languages yet. So for now, this is I believe this is an English only feature, but looking at the controls of what you can do with the words, uh, because you know when you're asking data questions. You're really only you know, using so many words. Uh, when did you sell something? Where did you sell something? So it shouldn't be that complex to translate to other languages or s try, uh, simply try and implement um, the linguistic schema with your own words and your own languages. Right. Oh, it, is it is a super try. cool feature though and something that I would love to see more people using in the real world other than cool demo tricks. Exactly. And I think what's, what's uh, cool about this too is for the Power BI app for, for iPhones, for example, or for iOS, um, uses the, the keyboard feature where you can actually talk to the, uh, to the keyboard. So you can, in the Power BI app, you can actually ask your Power BI questions just by talking to your phone, and it'll basically render um, some visuals based on what you're asking it taking that even one step further. So you don't even have to like sit and type your questions about your data any longer. You just open up your Power BI app and say, hey, what were my sales for this city last month, last week, whatever it is? Um, and they'll show you the data. No need to look it up, you just you just ask. And that could also include information like that, that may be more action oriented. Say, hey, I wanna see all of our products that are out of stock. I wanna see our accounts that haven't had um, 
an opportunity for a while. Of course, that needs to be specified how long that is. Um, so you can do that kind of list and get those like actionable lists too and say, hey, here's some products where we need to place some orders. Here's some uh, opportunities that haven't been contacted for a while we need to follow up on. Um, you know, I don't say we normally we would actually have already prepared for a dashboard, but if there's something specific that comes up or, or you want to you know, do the same thing for a specific region, you can simply just ask Power BI instead of trying to modify the different dashboards or trying to drill down on the different dashboards. You just get the information directly from there. Cool. That's awesome. So before we go, Ulrich, I wanted to mention um, you recently wrote a week worth of tips on CRM Tip of the Day about yes. charts. <laughs> we called it Chart Week. George Dubinsky messed up the scheduling a little bit, so it was more like a week and a half. But that, that beside, there were some really good <laughs> tips there. So if, if people listening to this haven't read those, but I love the one about um, using textures for colorblind users. I just wanted to find out a little bit more. Did that come from a real project deployment where you were helping someone who had uh, was visually colorblind? Uh, so... Um I'm glad you asked, and I'm also not glad you asked because it's a little <laughs> embarrassing, but it is a real question that somebody put on my blog. Um, I, I actually emailed me directly about it. I didn't really have time to follow up on it. I think I may have like given some short response by an email, and this is like two, three years ago, and I was finally, okay, I, and it's been in the back of my mind. I, I have to get this one out there because... It was, uh, I think it was a, a lady who was working with pe a couple of people who were colorblind and couldn't tell some of the bars and colors apart and wanted to add and simply needed to figure out what her other options were. Um, and adding those textures is essentially the, the best option. But it's interesting, like when you look at the statistics of the amount of people who, who are actually colorblind, it's a lot more than you would expect because you don't really um, hear it as much. Maybe that people don't speak out as much. Um, I just have learned to to detect the nuances, uh, differences in, in colors on the screen, right? But right. it's interesting because it is a very color-based medium that we're working with, all these dashboards, charts, etc. Um, and you have to be able to distinguish those, of course. So another option of doing that, if if the colors gets a little too muddy, uh, you can, of course, change it to radically different colors. Uh, or you can use the textures, too. Um, to add some some additional uh, differentiation options there, and sometimes changing the color palette too, because I I have a colleague who's red and green color blind. He can see other colors okay, but has trouble distinguishing between red and green. So have, you know sometimes you might use different color palettes. But that tip could be useful for Power BI as well, right? You could you could do the same sort of thing with the Power BI chart, right? Uh, no, that that is a Dynamics 365 chart exclusive feature. Uh, <laughs> okay, but I mean you can choose different color palettes. Yeah, you you can change out the color palettes. You can you can definitely uh, change out the color palettes. You can apply the uh, a whole new palette to your report, so all your new visualizations will follow that color pattern. Uh, so yeah, you definitely have some options there, and you can avoid those uh, color combinations that tends to be tricky for, for people who are colorblind, uh, but you cannot add those different textures or, or backgrounds. At least okay. not yet. They tend okay. to, uh, you know, they release new stuff every month, so who knows? Might be coming. <laughs> okay. Okay, well, great. Great. Well, Ulrich, I appreciate, uh, appreciate it. Uh, this has been useful, so check out the GDPR white paper and also look into the uh, Q&A linguistics, what's it called? <laughs> Q&A linguistic schema and there Power BI uh, the Power BI team created some great videos so if you are interested in getting some step by step um, step by step procedures and tips and, and really deep dive on this and work with it on your, your data model uh, we'll put the link in there for, uh, for those videos This has been Power BI and More with Ulrich Carlson and Joel Lindstrom. You can follow Ulrich at his blog, CRMChartGuy.com, or follow him at Twitter at CRMChartGuy. This episode is a production of Dynamics Podcast, LLC.